built as a literal refuteration of Dungeons and Dragons, Tunnels and Trolls was the second role-playing game ever released. Its goal was to fix everything wrong with Dungeons and Dragons. Did it succeed? Well, let's find out. What's up, Internet? Jay here with Nerd Rage Against the Machine, and today we're going to talk about Tunnels and Trolls. Tunnels and Trolls is the second role-playing game ever produced, and we're going to talk a little bit about its history, but ultimately it was meant to kind of be Pepsi to D&D's Coke, if you will. Um, while there have been many other games in the fantasy role-playing sphere besides just Tunnels and Trolls that have taken on D&D, among them, of course, Pathfinder, RuneQuest, Rollmaster... Um, even things like Conan or or, or Stormbringer. Um, Tunnels and Trolls was the first. And it has a very interesting history, which I think is worth exploring, as well as taking a look at the game itself to see if it's indeed any good. Um, so that's what we're going to do right now. And now a little bit into the history of Tunnels and Trolls. It's a pretty fascinating game for its history. Um, the big thing was that uh, the designer, Ken St. Andre, had... Uh, had bought a copy of, or had gotten a copy of D&D from his local wargaming group and was asked to run it. After running it, he loved what he saw, but also found a lot of criticism. You know, it's like anything else. I love it, but this, that, and the other. Uh, among his complaints were the fact that $10 was way too much for a rule set. Of course, this was the early mid-70s, where this 8th edition version that I have in my hands right now is $60 in hardcover and 50 I think, in, in softback. So, a little more than 10 bucks, but well worth it. Uh, this is literally everything you need in one book. The other one, of course, being the use of wacky dice. You know, finding those dice back in the day was tough. Um, I can remember when I started in the mid-80s, and, and finding polyhedral dice was not something you'd find everywhere. Nowadays, you can find them at Walmart or Target, of all places. Who knew? Um, I mean, that's one of the reasons that players were kind of, you know, obsessive about the crappy dice that came in the red box, because, well... If you lost one of those, what were you going to do? I mean, crap, you had to go buy a whole other $12 rule set. Jeez. So on top of that, this rule set only uses D6s. Just the dice that you can you know, squirrel out of a Monopoly or a Yahtzee game. And that's it. On top of that, the rule set was decidedly cheaper. It was mimeographed at the time. Um, probably five bucks for, or so for the rule book, if I'm not mistaken. Um... What this game did was very different from D&D, though. There's a lot of differences. Now, there are some similarities. Uh, there are classes, but they're much looser. It's basically three classes, fighter, wizard, and rogue, with each giving a little benefit, basically imparting a benefit, not taking from you. Um, you know, your wizard can wield a sword. It's just the fighter's going to do a hell of a lot better job at it. Um, that kind of thing. The big thing, though, is that this is a very wild and wacky system. And that's a good thing. Um, one example of that is that you roll 3d6 for stats, just like you do in D&D. However, most D&D players came up with their own kind of house rule on how that was done. Maybe it was four dice and chuck out the lowest, or four dice, chuck out the lowest, and re-roll any ones, or or point-based system, or what have you. And you see that in, in later editions. I remember 5th Ed had like a bunch of you know different alternatives to just rolling dice. In Tunnels and Trolls... You're going to roll three dice, and you're going to put them where they where they lay. And there's a couple reasons for that. The first of which is that your dice, if you roll three of the same number, so three ones, three twos, three threes, three fours, three fives, three sixes, etc., um, you get to take those same dice, roll again, and add. It's what they call taro, triples, and roll over. So this means that you could have some pretty wild stats as a starting character. If you roll a three in D&D, you're kicking the table and screaming and yelling that you're going to have, you know, somebody with either the world's worst charisma, the world's worst intelligence, or a total wuss. And Tunnel Control is rolling a three. is like, well, that's a plus three to whatever I roll next. Eh, let's find out. Additionally, um, the bonuses are different. 
in D and D, most bonuses are simply a plus one or plus two. You know, like a dwarf might get a plus two to Constitution, maybe minus one to Charisma. In Tunnels and Trolls, they're multiples. So bragging that I have a 18 strength in D and D is, you know, it's very simple for a TNT character to look over and go, "My strength 35." Wuss. <laughs> it leads to some very wacky de deviations. Additionally, because of that. To determine your level, unlike D&D &D where all players start at level 1, in Tunnels and Trolls, level is almost more like a challenge rating. And how that works is you take your highest stat, divide by 10, and round down. That is your character's starting level. So it is possible, especially if you're playing an elf, a dwarf, or, or, or even one of the more crazy races, this has a ton of races to cho choose from. Um, way more than D&D. &D. And if the GM is more than willing, you can even go completely bonkers with some things like werewolves and stone trolls and dragons even. Um, all from this core book. But in saying that, yeah, your level might not be one. You might start with a level three dwarf, a level four dwarf, a uh, level five elf. It's hard to tell until you actually build that character. Um, which is kind of a cool thing. All task resolutions in this game are very simple. Um, it's what they call a saving throw. And what you do is you take your stat and you try to roll under it versus a formula. Um, it's like, I think it's like 5 plus 15, or 5 per level plus 15 versus the difficulty. But it's, it's the simplest formula. It's in the book. I'd, I'd have to remember it off the top of my head, which I didn't do that much research. Sorry. Uh, if I ever run it again, I'll definitely reread that chapter uh, quick enough. But. Um, it is a very simple task resolution, and it's the same task for everything, which is, again, a, a very big difference from early D&D, &D, was this idea of everything is codified into one system as opposed to, you know, like, this task is done this way, you know, bend bars is a percentile, lift gates is a percentile, um, pick pockets is something else, um, a straight dex check or climbing check is something totally different, and combat, of course, is way different, you know, no thackos and all that. Um, that's where this game is a very different animal. Which leads us to the other big change in this game, which is combat. Unlike D&D, um, this game really does eschew the idea of miniatures. Um, whereas in D&D, you know, even in the least miniature-friendly edition, they're accepted. Tunnels and Trolls is much more theater of the mind than D&D. Um, to that end, how combat works is, is very cool and very simple. Uh, it, it literally is a roll-off. Now, one thing you'll notice, and I'm going to bring this up first, of course, is that the book is pretty thick. This is, like I said, everything you need, but there's not a monster section. There's no real bestiary. There's no real monster manual to speak of. Instead, what Tunnels and Trolls does is you have two choices. As I said, there's a, a massive list of, of races. If it's a big bad or a boss kind of character, you can literally build them using the, 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 the species template and dice. But if you just want, like, say, a horde of kobolds or a horde of orcs or, or maybe just a basilisk or something that you want to run around, you give it whatever special abilities you deem fit, and then you generate what's called a monster rating, which is an, um, an amount of hit points the creature has and an amount of dice that he'll throw. Um, so let's say if an MR is 8, he gets 8 dice and 80 hit points. Pretty simple stuff. Now with that in mind, what you're going to do is every player would roll their attack at the same time. There's no initiative. So everyone who's taken an attack with a sword would roll their sword's value, you know, the damage factor of the sword. Then your monster would do the exact same, and you would compare the two lines. You know, okay, so the, the basilisk, basilisk did more damage by X amount, that then gets distributed over the party. Or vice versa, the party does more than the basilisk, then the basilisk takes that, that difference. Now, the only oddity to this is sixes. If you roll a natural six, it's what we call spite damage. Spite damage is damage that gets through no matter what. Your armor won't absorb it. You're, um, you're going to take that damage. Just one point of damage for every, every dice that rolls a six to represent the idea that even when you're doing well, there's a chance you're going to, you know smack something or, 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 or strain something or what have you. Um, this is where spite damage comes from. Which makes combat pretty easy. Now, if you decide to do ranged or um, magic spells during combat, you kind of pull yourself out. You're still available to take damage, but you roll your damage separately. You roll your attack separately, kind of as a, as a back, back bench kind of thing. Um, the best way I can describe combat is, I would honestly think if you're going to use miniatures, it don't look more like a 
old school Final Fantasy, you know, put your figures on the field and everyone who's going to go melee, you know, put them up front. Everyone who's not, go back. And then Monster, same thing. Um, it works really well. And again, it's very fast. Very fast combat, which also does, you know, avoid things like, you know, long times of initiative questions or analysis paralysis, which makes the game a lot of fun. The other thing about that, though, is because of the lack of detail for monsters and things, I do think whenever I've run Tunnels and Trolls, I tend to jump more toward traps and puzzles rather than combat encounters because the combat is is quick and easy and deadly at times, but it's not anything where you're going to be spending a lot of time with tactical choices either, for good or for bad. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when looking at Tunnels and Trolls as, as an alternative to D&D is, you know, with all its faults, the D&D can still be kind of tactical, especially with minis. Um, Tunnels and Trolls is kind of a shoes that. Now, the other thing is that TNT, unlike Dungeons and Dragons, does not take itself too seriously. Um, there are all sorts of examples of this game being goofy, just not just from the artwork, but from the personality of the game. Um, there's a spell, a first level spell called Take That, You Fiend, which sounds a lot funnier than Magic Missile. Um... And some other spells that also have that same, you know, now you see me, now you don't, you know, these kind of things that are kind of goofy. And that tongue-in-cheek attitude kind of permeates this game. Um, again, if you're looking for something grim, dark, or, you know, you're looking to, to be very hardcore, this game definitely doesn't have that feel. I mean, yes, as a GM, you could always pull the game in that direction and ignore these things, even change the names of things like, you know, change Take That You Fiend into... Mystic Bolt or something like that to make it sound cooler. But at its heart, it really is a game that is designed for old school dungeon crawling fun. Um, that is the one thing I will say that's good about this game. I enjoy this, the, the aspect of this game as what it is. It is a dungeon crawler. It is not a, a massively overthought or, or, or grim dark game at all. It can be a lot of fun and for its age, it's actually held up really well. There is an additional RPG out called Monsters Monsters, which is basically this in another form, the idea being instead that you play monsters. I've run that one a couple times. The one warning I would have for that one is you do really need to rein in what kind of monsters you're playing. You know, if one person wants to play a dragon, maybe they should all be dragons. Or if you want to play werewolves, then everyone be a werewolf or a vampire, or at least a humanoid in that same scale. Um... This game has a, has a tendency to go off the rails of scale. And also with that, when you're talking about task resolution, same thing as before when I talked about Taro, triples and rollover. The same thing is true when you roll your um, chance to succeed. It's always rolling high. Um, you have doubles and rollover. You roll 2d6, add your stat versus the difficulty. If you roll doubles, you roll again and add. So this is an early example of a game that had exploding dice. Um so it is a very weird, wacky, wild game. Um, definitely more random than than your traditional D and D uh, tamp down. But it is fun. That is the thing about this game. That this is not again. If you're looking for the most simulated combat you could come up with, the best representation of tactical resolution, this ain't it. But if you want a good beer and pretzels. We're here to mostly gab and shoot the breeze and, and occasionally search for treasure and, and, and hunt some works. You could do a hell of a lot worse than Tunnels and Trolls. I'm going to give this one a 5 out of 5 just for that. Um, again, the material for the world is decent. Um, there is a lot more in here, including skills, which are you know optional rules. Uh, also, there are additional classes. If you do Taro a stat you have a chance at what is effectively a prestige class, which gives you another bonus. So again, there's a lot to go over in here, and, and definitely for 60 bucks, you could do a lot worse for a rule book. Um, to that end, I'm going to say again, 5 out of 5, well worth trying, and uh, I bid you adieu, and happy gaming.